I bet even the biggest Disney fans don't know all these secrets at the Magic Kingdom. Hey Club, it's Molly and I am continuing our Secrets video series today at the Magic Kingdom. The series where I take you on some of those popular attractions in the park and spill the tea on all the Imagineering details, fun facts, Easter eggs, backstories, all that fun small stuff that makes these attractions so, so amazing. So today we are at the Magic Kingdom, the most popular park at Walt Disney World. Gonna ride six of the most popular attractions, maybe get some snacks along the way. Who knows what could happen? It's gonna be a lot of fun. Let's get to it. Today's adventures start in the land of adventure as we head to two of the most popular attractions here. Two of my favorites in the park, perhaps two of yours as well. That's right, friends. We are headed to the Magic Carpets of Aladdin, a fan favorite and one of the most popular rides in Walt Disney World. I'm obviously joking. We're going to Jungle Cruise. Wouldn't that have been funny, though? Jungle Cruise, an opening day attraction both here and in Disneyland, has been a fan favorite ever since it opened. This ride was actually inspired by Walt Disney's personal travels down to South America. He was sent on a Goodwill ambassador tour of South America and he saw all kinds of incredible things. He met people from all over. He saw amazing animals and jungles and wanted to bring that to his park. And when I say he wanted to bring this to his park, I mean quite literally. He wanted to bring real life animals. He wanted real elephants. He wanted real hippos. He wanted real snakes. And I talked about this in the Animal Kingdom Secrets video. Go check that one out if you haven't already when I talked about Kilimanjaro Safaris. Because this ride is actually the predecessor to Kilimanjaro Safaris. It was Walt's brother Roy that was like, Walt, buddy, love you. Where are we putting elephants in Disneyland? We have not that much property. It's teeny tiny over here. Where do you think we're getting the money to pay for these? And how are you going to make these nocturnal animals on the foreground for people to see them when they're on the boats. So obviously they used mechanical animals here at the Jungle Cruise, but again, it was Walt Disney's idea and it was realized in 1998 when Animal Kingdom opened with Kilimanjaro Safaris. But while it was Walt's idea for this to have real animals, it was also his idea for it to be educational. And I know you're thinking, Molly, this ride is not educational. It's funny and whimsical. Kilimanjaro Safaris is educational. That is correct. Originally, when this attraction debuted in Disneyland, it had a very educational, non-humorous script about the mechanical animals, similar to what you currently hear on Kilimanjaro Safaris. The skippers did not tell punny jokes, they did not say sarcastic things, instead they told you about lions and tigers and elephants. And as you can imagine, if you're a skipper, going around the same boat track every day for eight hours a day, 15 or so minutes of boat ride, gets a little repetitive, gets a little redundant. The animals, unlike a Kilimanjaro Safaris, are doing the same thing every time. Now the legend goes that the skippers started making some titterings, they started making some jokes, they started cracking some puns just to make their day more exciting. And again, as the story goes, Walt Disney one day, he often liked to go to the park at Disneyland and observe the attractions to see what guests were liking, what they weren't liking. Uh, he wanted to make sure people always had fun coming to the park. And he was in the bushes, <laughs> Of Jungle Cruise and guests were like laughing on the boats. They're they're having a little crack up and he's like, why are they laughing? This is not funny. This is very serious and educational. And he listened and he realized that the skipper was telling jokes and making puns, and that the guests were laughing and having a good time. And then he talked to the guests and the guests said they liked riding this ride over and over again so they could hear the different jokes. And that, friends, is how the Jungle Cruise became the punny, funny, skipper, fan favorite attraction that it is today. It is the skippers that did it, not the Imagineers, which I kind of love. Now, it would be impossible to talk about the Jungle Cruise or Adventureland in general without talking about the horticulture. The horticulture, the plants, the trees, the bushes, the flowers that they use in each individual land really help bring that story to life. As you can see, we are in the jungles of South America right now, so we have big, large bushes, very different from Main Street USA, where we had the nice manicured lawns of turn of the century small town USA. But. I want to talk about a specific gentleman and his name is Bill Evans. Bill Evans was the horticulturist master of the Disney company. He did the horticulture here in Walt Disney World. He did it in Disneyland as well. And in Disneyland, they were on quite a budget when they were rolling out the park. They did not have the funding or the means to go get exotic plants from all over the world and plant them in the Jungle Cruise to bring it to life. But Bill, a resourceful man, figured out that if he took orange trees, which they have in abundance in Southern California, and planted them upside down, they looked exotic, they looked intriguing, and they looked different. So orange trees planted upside down were the primary plant first used in the Jungle Cruise in Disneyland. 
Now here at Walt Disney World's Jungle Cruise, they had a little bit more funding. They were able to go with a bit more exotic of plants and they did import a bunch of plants. But they have to maintain these plants, make sure they keep their livelihood, make sure they keep their bright green, beautiful colors. And they actually have to temperature control the plants. A lot of the plants that they're using are used to a more humid climate than here. I know, I don't think that's possible, but apparently it is. So there's actually misters and fans throughout the jungle if you look deep into the woods. There's also heaters for the like seven days a year when it drops below 70 degrees here, we gotta keep those plants alive. So the plants are actually very meticulously maintained and they make sure to keep that nice humid tropical rainforest for them 365. I, I can't imagine it being more humid than this. Do you see my sweat stash? Oh my gosh. Now, enough of me talking, let's get on the ride, but last thing before we do, I'm gonna tell you a couple things to look for when you're actually on the attraction. First things first, you've probably already noticed that the water is a brownish greenish color when you go through the Jungle Cruise and you're probably like, ugh, is this water sanitary? Are you sure this water sanitary? It looks questionable to me. Yes, it is. It is chemically treated. It's also chemically dyed. They use a chemical, uh, they add it to the waterfall actually and let it rain down like the chocolate waterfall in Willy Wonka to make sure that the river is dyed the right color. This not only hides the tracks and the mechanics of the boat, but it does give you the illusion that you are sailing on mystic jungle rivers around the world. Whilst on the Jungle Cruise, they're going to make a bunch of jokes about a plane and you can see one half of a plane and they'll say things like, well, how'd I get my job here? It's plain to see. I took a crash course. The other half of that plane, Imagineers are often resourceful, used over at the great movie ride, may it rest in pieces, during the Casablanca scene. When you get to the newly reimagined totem pole scene, uh, where the skipper Felix and the other crew have climbed up to avoid getting the point in the end from the rhinos, the, there is one gentleman I want you to pay attention to. He's got a shocked look on his face. We are gonna see him again later in this video over at the Haunted Mansion. Spoiler alert, he's the caretaker. He's the grave digger. Another thing to look for, this is actually very very difficult to notice and it's one that I can hear Max rolling his eyes yes hear him rolling his eyes all the way from California it's a hidden mini now it is very tricky to see but when you are exiting the temple on the left hand side in the concrete is a profile of Minnie Mouse you can see her bow you can see her nose you can see her face it's very difficult to see so this is one I'm sure some people like Max would be like that's not a real thing but I was taught that by Disney, it is. So there you go. And last but not least, you may know that this attraction recently went through somewhat of a refurbishment, somewhat of an upgrade. They took out a few scenes and added in some few new ones, things like the monkeys and more of the boat sinking. The most iconic scene that they changed though was they took out Trader Sam. Turns out cannibal jokes aren't apparently appropriate for a theme park of children of all ages. Who knew? But if you know who Trader Sam is, you are familiar with the legend, you are familiar with the predecessor animatronic, then you will notice there is still a nod to Trader Sam, as you can see his hat on the gift shop table. Now that we are in the queue, wanted to point out a couple things to you. First of all, if you go eat at the Skipper Canteen, which is the Jungle Cruise themed restaurant, you will see a lot of nods to these different characters and these different skippers. They have a lot of fun talking about all the different skippers, um, and your server is going to be a skipper over there, so I love that. But one person I wanted to point out is right Right here the KP Rafferty All Skipper Pun Championship. KP Rafferty is a nod to Kevin Rafferty who's an Imagineer who brought attractions like Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway and Cars Land to life so I love that nod there. I also love that all the skippers have different awards and things like they have this kind of club. Uh, they give out the Golden Piranha, the Rookie Skipper of the Year so that is very very fun. I also believe these are actual skippers that are here working at the Jungle Cruise which is hilarious. Another thing I love about the Jungle Cruise is that at Christmas time it becomes the Jingle Cruise. They decorate the mechanical animals on the attraction with Santa hats and different things. They change all the names of the boats to be different uh, holiday related puns and the skippers tell holiday and Christmas jokes. So if you're around for the Christmas season that is a very fun thing you can look forward to. Jungle Cruise is very popular and tends to go very quickly on Genie Plus especially on a busy busy day. I recommend booking this one first if you have Genie Plus and you're wanting to ride Jungle Cruise. One of the reasons that it often has a very long line is because it has a very low capacity. Not that many people can fit on these boats. It also has a load, unload, and load process, uh, which 
lengthens an attractions line as well. So this is a good one to book Genie Plus on, and it's a good one to be your first choice if you want to ride this. My other favorite thing to do when I am in the Jungle Cruise line is listen up because the skippers will make funny announcements overhead and also read everything you can because if you read a bunch of the signs and crates, you are going to notice some very good puns. My personal favorite of the signs is the lunch menu. There are also several nods to SEA, which is the Society for Explorers and Adventurers. Uh, it's a mythical society that a lot of Disney attractions, rides, movies, restaurants, lore is about. Indiana Jones would be in SEA, for example. There's tons of nods to it in the Skipper Canteen. That's what the Adventurers Club was all about. And Hightower Industries, a nod to Hightower, who looks a lot like an Imagineer you might recognize. To them, wave goodbye to each other. We're not going to make it that far. Not with my driving. It's pretty bad. You can also make goodbye to those people in line. Yeah, they still have five and a half more hours to go. <laughs> They're lost. But anyway, where are my manners? Welcome on board to the world famous Jungle Cruise. My name is Skipper Camella. That's first name Skipper, last name Camella. The colossal, the stunning, the gorgeous, the never before seen, the absolutely breathtaking. I'm running out of adjectives. It's the eight wonder of the world. Give it up for the backside of the water. Okay, so I was looking for this particular crate that used to be out here, addressed to Ken Anakin, and a very kind skipper came over and told me that he hasn't seen that one in a long time. It it must be moved somewhere else in Adventureland or it's not here anymore, but it's a cool nod because Ken Anakin directed the Swiss Family Robinson and what's right there? The Swiss Family Treehouse. So that was a cool nod. There also used to be a crate addressed to Bill Evans, who I was saying was the horticulture imagineer, but they got rid of that one too. So things come and go as things get updated. But the skipper also told me that those skippers on the wall, he confirmed those are real skippers. One from the restaurant. One from the restaurant, one from the attraction. They were actually nominated by their fellow skippers. Essays were written about them. It was literally a skipper of the year competition held by the actual cast members. And he let me know that skipper Kate, who was the skipper from the actual attraction, well, she was on a pretty notorious Jungle Cruise boat ride a few years ago that Let's just say it was uh, a whole flood of fun. <laughs> now, I do have a few minutes before my Pirates of the Caribbean Lightning Lane. It's not a super busy day today, but one of my favorite fun facts that Pirates is in the Lightning Lane specifically, so we had to go there. But that means we have time for a snack. Two of the best snacks in Magic Kingdom are here in Adventureland. Do I go sweet for a coconut Dole Whip, my favorite? Or do I go savory and get cheeseburger spring rolls? Guess what you think I'm gonna do? And in a moment, I'll show you. If you guess spring rolls, you're right. Had to get myself a little cheeseburger spring roll action. These are one of my favorite snacks in the Magic Kingdom. Probably my favorite savory snack here. They are two spring rolls and they are filled with everything that makes a cheeseburger delicious. So beef, pickles, cheese. Um, it comes with an aioli, a secret sauce, which is like a Thousand Island like any other secret sauce at any burger place ever. They are absolutely delicious. I often get these for a meal because I don't think the quick service at Magic Kingdom is that great. These are perfect for a meal. There's also a 50th specialty edition one that's got pastrami and pepper jack that comes with honey mustard. Also delicious, but I'm loyal to the cheeseburger. Disney World, trash can time. Disney World, trash can time. They're just delicious. You've got the nice flaky crust, strong cheese flavor, a little zest from the pickles. Now they are pre-made. I get people ask a lot like, can I not get pickles? Like, no, they are, you get what you get, but they are delicious. I love them, fan fave. Snack consumed and I've made it to my favorite ride here in the Magic Kingdom, Pirates of the Caribbean. Now, Pirates of the Caribbean, a lot of people think it's an opening day attraction here in the Magic Kingdom. It's a quintessential Disney classic. It's a fan favorite, a beloved attraction, but it was actually not an opening day attraction here, and that was on purpose. Despite Pirates of the Caribbean opening in 1967 in Disneyland, in fact, it was the last attraction that Walt Disney personally had a hand in supervising. Maybe that's one of the reasons I love it. Maybe it's just a perfect attraction. Maybe it's both. But despite having the technology, having the plans for this attraction already existing, the Imagineers chose not to debut Pirates of the Caribbean when the Magic Kingdom opened in 1971. That's because of a few reasons. One, we are in Central Florida. 
we are near where literal pirates existed. So they thought people would more rather enjoy seeing historical pirate things throughout Florida and the Caribbean. Not only are there historical pirate type things around this area, there's also a lot of touristy, kitschy attractions. And they thought no one's gonna wanna ride a pirate's ride in the Magic Kingdom when there are like kitschy pirate experiences around the area. But oh, how wrong they were. People had seen Pirates of the Caribbean on Wonderful World of Disney. They were familiar with it from Disneyland and people demanded Pirates of the Caribbean. So, park opened in 1971. Pirates of the Caribbean was added just two years later in 1973. There was just one little problem. Pirates of the Caribbean is a huge attraction. I'm gonna let you in on a secret. What you see for attractions is not the whole attraction. Like you see this Caribbean fortress right here, you go in through the queue, you get on your boat. What you don't realize is there's a huge building backstage that you can't see that houses the majority of the attraction. So they had a huge problem with, we have this big attraction and we have train tracks going all the way around the Magic Kingdom. We don't have enough room to fit everything we need for Pirates of the Caribbean within the train tracks. So what do you do? Now it's at this point I would like to tell you something about the Magic Kingdom as a whole. We'll get back to Pirates, Pin and Pirates, we'll get back to it. Walt Disney had this thing that he hated about Disneyland. And that's one day he was walking through Tomorrowland and he saw a cowboy walking through and he stops the cast and he's like, what are you doing? Kessler said, well, I work in Frontierland, but employee parking is behind Tomorrowland. The only way for me to get there is walk through. And Walt Disney's like, but it's destroying the show. The illusion of being in Tomorrowland is gone when you see a cowboy walking through it. So one thing he always wanted was a secret way for cast members to get to where they needed to go without walking through the public areas of the park. They thought about doing a tunnel system, but we are in a swamp. When you try to dig a tunnel, it fills up with water. So you can't dig a tunnel here in front of the Magic Kingdom. What you can do, however, is build a whole building. Then you can dig a big hole in front of that whole building, let that fill with water, take all that dirt from that big hole, put it on top of that building, and then build the Magic Kingdom on top of it. Which means whenever you're in the Magic Kingdom, you are actually on the second story on top of another building. And that big hole became Seven Seas Lagoon, which you have to ride on the ferry boat or cross on the monorail to get to the Magic Kingdom. What does all this have to do with Pirates of the Caribbean? Remember, we're on the second story, train tracks are on the second story, they need to get us backstage, not on the second story, back to the first story. What's one of the first things that happens when you go on Pirates of the Caribbean? Shout it at your TV, you go down a drop. That drop is actually functionally taking you under the train tracks into a building backstage, which is on the first story. You ride around, and then when you exit, what do you do? You get out of the boat, you ride an escalator back up. That's taking you back under the train tracks, back onto the second story, and now you're here in the Magic Kingdom again. A couple more cool history things before we go ride Pirates of the Caribbean. This attraction was brought to you by a lot of Imagineers, but I'm going to touch on two of my favorite Imagineers right here. Number one is Mark Davis. Mark Davis was one of Walt Disney's nine old men, one of his original animators, and a lot of the original Imagineers were actually pulled from the animation studio because of their artistry and creativity. Mark Davis brought to life some of the most famous Disney ladies of all time. I'm talking Maleficent, I'm talking Wendy, I'm talking Alice, uh, and he was known for his sense of humor. He could do very funny sight gags. He was a very uh, funny guy to be around, always making people laugh. So anything you see in a classic Disney attraction that makes you laugh, like the gentleman being chased up the pole by the rhino we just saw in Jungle Cruise, uh, like some of the humorous gags you're going to see in Pirates of the Caribbean and Haunted Mansion, that was probably Mark Davis. Now I'm going to talk about Mark Davis more in a second because of one of my favorite details on the attraction, but just know this attraction was largely brought to life by him. Another of my favorite Imagineers, the first female Imagineer, one of the first three Imagineers overall, her name was Harriet Burns. Now she was a classy lady. She showed up every day to work dressed impeccably. I'm talking a skirt, I'm talking a dress, I'm talking heels, and yet she kept up with the boys. She stood on ladders, she did everything the boys could do while working in Imagineering. Harriet Burns was a detail artist. She did things like hand sew real human hair onto that one pirate's leg you'll see hanging from Pirates of the Caribbean. So Harriet Burns, she also has a lovely story. She was, again, this is one of the last rides that Walt Disney himself supervised, and one of the ways that he saw this ride come to life, because he never actually got to ride it, was that she had made a two-scale model of Pirates of the Caribbean, and she sat him down in a chair. She put all of those models up on planks, and she pushed him around so he could see it from the point of view of actually riding the attraction. I'm also going to bring up Exitensio here. Exitensio not only wrote the narration for this attraction, and he wrote it in a way that you don't hear it all every time you go on 
the attraction, it's like a dinner party. When you walk through a dinner party, you hear snippets of this conversation and that conversation. So pending the timing of your boat, you're gonna pick up different things the pirates say throughout the attraction. He also wrote the lyrics for Yo Ho Yo Ho A Pirate's Life For Me. Having never written a song before, Walt Disney knew that he had quite a gift for words, uh, so he wrote the lyrics to Yo Ho Yo Ho Pirate's Life For Me, and we'll get to it, but Grim Grinning Ghosts as well. Whew. That's my favorite ride. Like I said, I could tell you so many things about it. You're probably getting sick of me talking. Uh, so let's get on the attraction. What are some things for you to specifically look for? First thing you're gonna wanna pay attention to, not a lot of people realize this, is Pirates of the Caribbean is actually a time machine. When you first board the boats and see the pirates, you'd see them like they are today, dead skeletons and then you go on that drop again taking you under the railroad tracks and it takes you back in time to the glory age of the pirates after seeing the ship starring captain barbosa which was an update i love this attraction because it is a great example of a disney attraction continuing to move forward continuing to progress but maintaining that classic disney energy so you have this amazing attraction which inspired one of the biggest grossing films uh biggest grossing series of all time pirates of the caribbean and then kids would ride this attraction and they would go, where's Captain Jack? Because they didn't realize the ride came first. So they added in Captain Jack and some of the other characters from the franchise, um, and there in turn, it's kind of a cyclical thing where the ride inspired the movies, which re-inspired the ride, and so on and so forth. After you see Barbosa, take a look on the right-hand side, and you will see that they are waterboarding a gentleman named Carlos to get some information. Take a look at the two pirates leading that charge. The first one is tall with dark hair and a hook hand. The second one is a little bit shorter, wearing blue stripes and red. Who do they remind you of? That's right, they are a nod to Captain Hook and Mr. Smee, a few other notorious pirates in the Disney canon. We're gonna talk about reusing faces yet again. That's one of my favorite Imagineering tricks. Blaine Gibson, the lead sculptor for many of these attractions, would sculpt one face based on people he saw. His wife often got mad at him for staring while in places like church because he would just look at faces and look at features and then he would sculpt them up to become pirates or ghosts or presidents or whatever else he was working on. But Blaine Gibson sculpted several faces and then they figured out they could reuse them dress them up with different costumes hair uh, and they can become a different character in fact you will see one character one pirate on both sides of the auction scene not only are, is he the final pirate in the line ready to auction off some items but he's one of the angry pirates on the other side of the boat take it one step further he is also one of the dancers in the haunted mansion a few more things to look for in the famous auction scene one of my favorite just attention to details one of the pirates on the left side of the boat is going to shoot a gun. It's actually going to pink and clink and make a sign move on the right side of the boat. Those are the kind of things that nobody really pays attention to, but that make these rides really come to life and feel so immersive. And lastly, you of course know the auctioneer, but do you recognize his voice? It is the voice of Paul Freeze, who also, spoiler alert, voiced the ghost host over at Haunted Mansion. Disney really loves to reuse people in, vo in voices and in faces. One more face to look for in my favorite scene, which is the dog uh, holding the keys and the pirates are trying to lure him with the bone. Look at the pirate that is whistling to the dog. We are gonna see that pirate again over at Haunted Mansion. Can you guess who it is? I'll give you till we get there to figure it out. And speaking of the dog, the dog was also reused. We don't just reuse human faces. No, no, we reuse full dogs as well. Because if you go ride the Carousel of Progress in Tomorrowland, you will see him as Rover. And if you go ride Living with the Land, you'll see him as the dog in the country scene at the beginning. All right, enough talking. Let's go ride Piratas del Caribe. Yo, ho, ho. Now, Pirates of the Caribbean isn't one you necessarily need to use a lightning lane on. Again, I'm specifically going through lightning lane because there is a cool detail I want to show you on this side of the queue. However, unlike some of the more popular rides here, like Jungle Cruise, like Splash Mountain, it tends to fluctuate with the weights a little bit more. These boats have a very high capacity, uh, so the wait time doesn't get quite as high most days as it does at some of the other attractions. So, you can use Genie Plus here. It's usually pretty easy to pull one, or you can usually cop on this when it's 30 minutes or less just wait for it to drop um, throughout the day. Early evening is normally a very good time to ride this one. Our mateys, let's go see David Jones Locker. That's my pirate voice. I don't think it's very good, but I'll work on it. Anyway, let's talk about what we're going to see here in the queue. Remember when I talked to you about Mark Davis, quite the ladies' man, quite the humorous fellow? Well, he also was a chess aficionado. He was a big fan of the game of chess, and he often worked chess into the attractions he was on. If you look down in the cell here in the lightning lane side of the queue, you can see two pirate skeletons playing a game of chess. Now, Mark Davis being the chess aficionado, 
that he is. He made sure that the pieces were arranged just so. If you're a chess fan, maybe you can see it as well. But they are arranged in a stalemate, meaning these pirates are pondering their next move for all eternity. And to take it one step further, the Imagineers wanted to make sure they could preserve this. So one time they were doing some maintenance on the attraction on the queue, and they wanted to make sure that they had uh, the pieces in the exact right spot to live out Mark Davis's legacy. So they took a bunch of pictures of it, they drew a guide, they did all kinds of things so that they could remember where the pieces go. But it turns out when they flipped the board over, Mark Davis had attached a picture of it because he also wanted to make sure that his joke lived on in perpetuity. One detail I miss is that on the escalator back up, there used to be a footprint and a dot as the marker instead of just the diamond because it was a peg like pirate that had walked here before. But I guess they had to change it for safety reasons. They had to have the diamond. The piratey fun isn't over, friends. You get dumped out into a gift shop. Shocking to new one. One of my favorite gift shops, though. However, there are a few cool things to look for, like this sword hanging over the exit sign here. That was screen used as well as my favorite screen used prop over this way. If you look at that red vase, face, vase. I don't know the difference. Is vase just fancier? Anyway, if you look at the red vase vase there, you will see that pirate medallion on the front. That is actually a screen used prop from Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl, my favorite of the Pirates films. If you remember from the film, there is the cursed Aztec gold, which is what puts the curse on Barbosa and his crew. And that is actually one of those pieces from the movie. And yes, like I said, we are doing six of the most popular attractions in the Magic Kingdom today. I know there are far more than six, but our videos are already long sometimes. And if I were to talk about every popular ride in the Magic Kingdom, this thing would be as long as Titanic. So if you're having fun, if you're enjoying it, let us know down in the comments and we can do a part two with some of the attractions we don't get to today. We have made it into Fantasyland, home to some of the most beloved and quintessentially Disney attractions of all. It's a small world. Peter Pan's Flight, Mad Tea Party, Dumbo the Flying Elephant, but we're headed to the newest Fantasyland ride, Seven Dwarfs Mine Train. Seven Dwarfs Mine Train opened alongside the rest of the Fantasyland expansion, which began opening in 2012. That included Enchanted Tales with Belle, Be Our Guest Restaurant, Under the Sea Journey of the Little Mermaid, revamping of Toontown into Storybook Circus, and again, Seven Dwarfs Mine Train. At the time, and to date, it's the biggest expansion the Magic Kingdom has ever had since it opened in 1971. Now, of course, if you're a huge Disney nerd like I am, you probably tuned into or read some of the news coming out of the recent D23 Expo where Josh Tomorrow said that that was the biggest expansion until now. And then they introduced the blue sky section of the panel, which is things the Imagineers are talking about and thinking about, but nothing concrete um, or set in stone yet. But one of the, the expansion they talked about at Magic Kingdom is expanding what could exist back behind Big Thunder Mountain. And they mentioned maybe Coco, they mentioned Casita, like Encanto, and they uh, mentioned potentially a villain's lamp. So again, that stuff, nothing set in stone, but the Imagineers did come on stage and talk about it. So. Who knows, maybe we'll have Villain's Kingdom at some point too as part of Magic Kingdom. But back to Seven Dwarfs Mine Train. Seven Dwarfs Mine Train is a first of its kind swinging coaster. Uh, it's not a super intense roller coaster. I put it somewhere between the Barnstormer and Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. However, the cars are brand new in that they swing back and forth like mine cars as well as going forward like a roller coaster, which is very fun. Seven Dwarfs Mine Train is also one of, if not the most popular ride in Magic Kingdom. It's the fancy ride at this park, meaning it's an individual cost if you want to skip the line. This one's not included with Genie Plus. Usually not too tricky to book as a non-resort guest. Um, if you want some more Genie Plus tips, I did a video recently where I hopped between Magic Kingdom and Disney's Hollywood Studios. Uh, and I also did one where I did as many rides as I possibly could in Magic Kingdom in just three hours, including Seven Doors Mine Train, so you can go check that out. It does tend to get a long line, however, so I recommend if you are a resort guest and you don't want to pay for it, rope dropping this one during that early park admission, or if you are a deluxe resort guest, riding this one during those deluxe resort hours. Otherwise, if you're not a resort guest, consider riding it in the evening time, especially if you don't care about fireworks. You get a great view of fireworks from the ride. 
Part of the reason for this attraction being themed to Snow White, one, it's the first Disney film, it's the first Disney princess, but also this is in a way the replacement of Snow White's Scary Adventures, which was across the way here in the courtyard. That got turned into Princess Fairy Tale Hall. That was an opening day dark ride attraction themed to Snow White. So they still wanted to have Snow White represented in the parks, which is why she has this more advanced attraction here. You can still ride Snow White's Scary Adventure over at Disneyland. However, when they reopened after the closure, they rethemed it to Snow White's Enchanted Wish. It is a perfect chef's kiss of blood new technology with old is absolutely amazing can't wait to make Disneyland content for you we'll certainly take you on that one but Snow White Scary Adventure can still be seen within this attraction there are a few Easter eggs there are a few reused figures that made their way across the way here first of all the vultures sitting up on some of the mining equipment looking down on you menacingly those are from the original attraction as well as some of the dwarfs in the final scene at the very end when you go past the cottage you can see Snow White dancing with the dwarves and the scary witch waiting for her outside and most of those dwarves are reused Bashful, Grumpy, Sleepy, Doc, and Happy are original figures. Sneezy and Dopey, as well as Snow White, were brand new for this attraction. Couple things to look for on the attraction. First of all, the animatronics are absolutely amazing in this one. I love this attraction because it's part thrill ride, part dark ride. It maintains that original nostalgia from the original ride. The dark ride scene when you go through the mine and you hear hi-ho with the dwarves. Feels very classic Disney. But then to infuse new technology into the roller coaster portion of it, but still it's generally a family attraction. It's a really, really great ride. Now, a couple things to look for, particularly in that mining scene. First of all, if you look on the left-hand side after you see Doc and whistles for the dwarves to get going, you can actually see the dwarf shadows projected as they go up the hill there singing hi-ho. A couple more things that are very tough to see, but I'm gonna do my best to get them on camera for you, are a hidden Oswald and a hidden Mickey in that same scene. Now, Oswald, not a lot of people realize, Mickey Mouse was not Walt Disney's original cartoon success. He originally drew a character named Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, and he partnered with Dun, 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 universal to bring this cartoon to life. But through a contract loophole, Walt lost the rights to not only Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, but also most of his best animators to Universal. And it was actually on a train ride back from New York City where he had this unfortunate meeting all the way back to California that he was sketching, he was drawing, he was thinking how he was gonna save his company and he drew a little mouse. And that's where Mickey Mouse came from. Interestingly enough, the executive at Universal that took Oswald from Walt Disney was named Charles Mintz. And if you're a fan of the film Up Like I Am, you may know the villain's name Charles Mintz. Is that coincidence? You tell me. But Oswald is back in the rightful ownership of the Disney company. They were able to purchase and acquire him several years ago at this point. Almost a hundred years though after he was lost. But if you look on the support beams for the mine as you're going up the hill on the left hand side there's actually a hidden oswald carved in on the left hand side and on the right hand side there's a little mickey carved holding a pickaxe like he's going to help the dwarves the seven dwarfs mine train is the first attraction i'm riding today with a height requirement it's only 38 inches though so it's not as high as the other mountains in magic kingdom yes that's right this one is considered the fourth mountain of magic kingdom the first of course being big thunder splash and space a very subtle and very cool detail not a lot of people realize in the queue is that if you listen to the music it might sound familiar but not you can't quite place it that's because the music in the queue part of the reel anyway is from a song called music in your soup music in your soup was a song cut from the original 1937 film but the imagineers wanted to make a nod give a nod to the original animators so they put it into the queue here to Frontierland friends where we are gonna face my arch nemesis water rides to show you some cool stuff on Splash Mountain before it's too late. JK JK Splash Mountain isn't going anywhere until 2024 when it's turned into Tiana's Bayou Adventure which I'm so so excited about this reaping sounds amazing I think Tiana absolutely deserves to an attraction the music sounds like it's gonna be great so maybe I'll like this ride more then. but for now I don't like water rides and this ride doesn't make me like them more so there you go but still fun stuff to talk about 
Let's get into Splash Mountain. Splash Mountain opened in 1989 in Disneyland. It opened in 1992, both here and Tokyo Disneyland, actually one day apart. And it was dreamt up by an Imagineer named Tony Baxter. Tony Baxter wanted to figure out what to do with some animatronics from a retired attraction called America Sings, which was a theater in the round style attraction similar to Carousel of Progress out in Disneyland that had a variety of animatronics and they weren't sure what to do with them. But as he was driving around one day, all of a sudden it hit him, stuck in that LA traffic. We could do a log flume water ride um, and we could do it kind of down folksy style and use some of those birds and other animals from America Sings. Originally, this attraction was gonna be called Zippity River Run after the iconic song Zippity Doodah, but it was chained by Michael Eisner. Michael Eisner wanted to cross promote a film that the studio was working on called Mountain. So that's why they changed it to Splash Mountain. I'm just kidding. The movie was called Splash. It's the mermaid movie with Daryl Hannah. That has nothing to do with this, but he was like, Splash, we'll throw Splash in the name of two things. People will love it. They'll think it's the same thing. A couple of things to look and listen for when you're on Splash Mountain. Remember when I was talking about getting you under the train tracks over at Pirates of the Caribbean? They got to do that at Splash Mountain too, because as shocking as it is, I know this literally blew my mind when I found out, that is not the whole ride. This is like a 12 minute long water flume ride. There's no way that whole thing can fit in what you can see on stage. So there's another big green building backstage that houses most of the attraction, but that's on the first story. So that first little drip drop down, when you go down into the story, that's getting you under the train tracks. And then you come back up when you are going through another lift later in the attraction. But obviously this, you can see Chickapin Hill, the mountain up at the top, that's obviously all on stage on the second story, but there is a big building in the back that houses the majority of the attraction. Quite possibly one of the best hidden Mickeys in all of Walt Disney World's on this attraction as well. It's right when you to the top of the hill. Now a lot of people remote. A lot of people are worried about that 52 foot drop down into the briar patch. I don't blame you. But if you take a second and look at the way the rock is formed at the opening at the top of the mountain, it's actually shaped in a profile Mickey looking this way. What I do like about Splash Mountain is that it combines two of the most iconic styles of Disney attraction. It is both a boat ride and a dark ride put together for about a 12 minute attraction. Another thing to look and listen for, when you get down into the room that's got all the jumping water and the frogs before you go up the big hill, you might notice that a little gopher pops down from the ceiling. If you listen very closely, he says, go FSU. That's because the Imagineer that worked on this part of the attraction was a Florida State fan, so he snuck in a little nod to his university. I wish I worked on an attraction and I could put Clemson in it. Clemson in it. Okay, I think I've done enough stalling. I mean, talking about Splash Mountain, so let's get in there. I would like to point out that this attraction has over 950,000 gallons of water. That's almost a million gallons of water. A lot of it hangs, hangs out in a reservoir backstage, which is why if you lose your hat on Splash Mountain, you are probably never getting it back. Here's a guest related fun fact. Despite this being the fastest ride at the Magic Kingdom, that's right, during the drop, you hit speeds of 40, 45 miles an hour. Big Thunder Mountain Railroad and Seven Doors Mine Train only clock in at about 35 and space doesn't even hit 30 miles an hour. But despite this again being the fastest ride in the Magic Kingdom, it didn't actually have lap bars until just a few years ago. The way the attraction works, the centrifugal force, the gravity, I don't understand science, but the way it works, you weren't gonna fly out of the attraction going down the hill. The lap bars were added because of guests. Because some guests are bad at common sense, they would get out during the attraction. They'd either get scared of going up the hill or they'd want to see the animatronics or if you paused for a few minutes because your boat was stalled for whatever reason, people would literally get out of the attraction. So the lap bars were added as a reminder to stay seated, not to get up on a moving vehicle and for safety reasons, but you don't actually need them to stay in the attraction when it goes down the hill. Splash Mountain is incredibly popular, usually is one of the longest lines in the park, especially on a hot day. Definitely a good one to use a lightning lane on if you are a fan of Splash Mountain and want to ride this one. I'd make it a pretty early priority after Jungle Cruise and Peter Pan's Flight. I would put this in your top three. If you do not want to buy Genie Plus, I would recommend rope dropping it, especially because it does not open for early theme park admission, so resort guests and not resort guests alike have the same chance to ride it first thing in the morning. However, she's cranky and temperamental, so she often doesn't open first thing in the morning, in which case I recommend checking if it's open. If it's not opening on time, ride Big Thunder or Pirates or something else nearby, and then coming back when it does. I do enjoy cute little Br'er Rabbit up there, and if you listen closely to Br'er Rabbit talking on the attraction, you may recognize 
recognize his voice if you're a fan of the cartoon The Animaniacs. Rare Rabbit and Wacko were both voiced by Jess Harnell, who also did Roger Rabbit at the Roger Rabbit Toon Spin in Disneyland, and he's also had small roles in lots of Disney movies, including Zootopia, Toy Story 3, WALL-E, Finding Nemo, and more. Disney loves to find voice actors that can do many, many things and then reuse them over and over again. But yeah, Wacko and Br'er Rabbit, same guy. Well, I guess it's time. Hang on, I'm not ready yet. Now I'm ready. Wally's patented water ride outfit can be yours for the price of whatever rain jacket and whatever you have you like. I just got this rain jacket because if you remember from the Stream Plans My Video uh, day when I rode Cali River Rapids four times in a row, my rain jacket was literally falling apart on me because I've had it for over a decade. I just got this pink one and I put it to the test. Where's the dad? Plot twist. I got evacuated off Splash Mountain, so. That didn't go according to plan. Or did it? No, I didn't. I didn't want to get evac'd off the ride. Uh, I wanted to show you guys that cool hit of Mickey, but there were some technical difficulties, so they evac'd us off the ride. Cast members were great, though. They came very quickly. They helped us out. They asked if anybody would have issues walking a little bit. They asked us not to take any photos or videos because we did go backstage for part of it. And then as we were walking back on stage, they very quickly and promptly gave us a lightning lane to use on another attraction. So I'm going to see if this one comes back up. Um, and I booked it. I did book a lightning lane over at Haunted Mansion, so we're gonna go do that. Unfortunately, the there must be lightning in the area because all the outdoor attractions are closed anyway. So I can't do Big Thunder right now. So again, plan: go ride Mansion. Hopefully by then, whatever weather is gone, and then ride Big Thunder, and then hopefully Splash will come back up and I can redeem that lightning lane. Otherwise, um, I'm coming back here in, next week to film a different video, and I'll I'll ride Splash then, and I'll get you the footage then that I was talking about. But just consider this my friendly PSA that, one, I yeah, did tell you Splash Mountain's temperamental, so there you go. And two, just be kind to the cast members. This is why you pack those patient pants, friends. They don't want the ride to break even less than you want it to break because then they get yelled at by people and they have to kick people off the ride and they don't want to do that. But uh, they are thinking of your safety first, so just be patient. Listen to the cast members. Follow their instructions. Uh, they will likely give you some kind of recovery, like another lightning lane or something. So just be friendly, be smiley. Uh, don't yell at cast members. And that's my PSA for the day on that. Let's go to Haunted Mansion. Welcome, foolish mortals, to the Haunted Mansion. I am your host, your human woman host, to tell you fun facts. <laughs> That was my impression of Paul Freeze. Again, the ghost host on the attraction. Again, he was the auctioneer over at Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, he was also Ludwig Von Duck in some of the Disney cartoons. You would be hard pressed to find another attraction in the Disney canon that had as much of a cult following as this one. Haunted Mansion was an opening day attraction here in 1971. It opened in Disneyland in 1969, but actually they built them at the exact same time. Now, Walt Disney himself dreamt of this attraction. He really wanted to do some kind of spooky, scary haunted house, but that begged one question. How do you make an attraction all about death at the happiest place on earth? So for a long time, the building was built, but it sat empty because the Imagineers had no idea how to do this attraction. Initially, they thought of a wax figure museum, like a walkthrough attraction, but then a little something changed everything, and that little something was the 1964-65 New York's World's Fair. That is where iconic attractions such as Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln, Carousel of Progress, and It's a Small World made their debut. But the fourth Disney attraction at the fair was called the Ford Magic Skyway. It was the predecessor to the People Mover attraction that we know and love here. It basically took hollowed out Ford convertibles and moved them connected by a rope by tires, pushing them forward in a continuous motion. That was the initial way that the Omnimover was designed, the Omnimover being the style of attraction that Haunted Mansion, Under the Sea Journey of the Little Mermaid, Buzz Lightyear, Space Ranger Spin, etc. are today. It's that constantly moving vehicle that the Imagineers can turn to face you at whatever you want to look at. That is how they decided to do Haunted Mansion because they can not only tell you a story by angling you at which direction and what they want you to see, but it also never stops making it an incredibly efficient ride vehicle. And one very cool thing about the Haunted Mansion are the cast members because they get to be part of the fun. If you ever notice, the mansion maids all wear a bat on top of their head. This is Brennan, and you give your bat a name, right? Yes. So my bat's name is Chloe. I <laughs> named her after the ghost that haunts the Myrtles Plantation in Louisiana. That's amazing. Yeah. That's so cool. I'm from there, so I had to name her. That's. A 
That's awesome. So next time you're at Haunted Mansion, ask a cast member what their bat's name is. Haunted Mansion was primarily designed by three Imagineers. This is again the return of Mark Davis, my favorite. Lots of fun, known for whimsy and humor and puns. Then we also had Claude Coates, who was a little bit darker of a soul. He was a background artist for Disney Animation, and he imagined the mansion to be spooky, scary, full of uh, dark ghosts, maybe a little too scary for Disneyland. And then the third Imagineer was named Rolly Crump. He was kind of an odd bird, a little bit of a more unusual guy, uh, and all three of them had their own distinct styles for the mansion. Now, Imagineering legend states that there were two models of the mansion. You had Mark Davis's funny sight gag, silly ghost mansion, and then you had Claude Coach is spooky, scary mansion, and the two of them could not agree to save their lives which mansion it was going to be. Spooky, funny, spooky, funny. They'd fight over it back and forth until finally their fellow Imagineers had had so much of their fighting that they said enough. They shoved the two models together and they said you get half and you get half, which is why the front half of the mansion is Claude Coates' mansion. It's the spooky mansion with the stretch room and the ghost host and all the scary things. But then the second half of the mansion is the fun, whimsical mansion. That's Mark Davis on a mansion. Think the graveyard with the ghost singing and dancing and having a tea party. And then for fun, sprinkle in anything a little bit weird and unusual, that's Rolly Crump. Think the grandfather clock where the fingers are the digits. Anything kind of weird and unusual like that, that was done by Rolly Crump. But Mark Davis wasn't done. He had to leave his mark one other place on the mansion. Where are my chess fans at? Because you might notice that the ornamentation on top of the mansion looks like chess pieces. Well, that's because those are chess pieces. Again, Mark Davis, huge chess fan, decided to decorate the top of the mansion with chess pieces. Now, there's a couple different legends, the way that goes. One of them is that the other Imagineers kind of messed around with him, and they put actual chess pieces on the roof of the mansion model that he had, and he was like, hey, I like it. I'll keep it. Um, and then the other version is that Mark Davis put them on there himself himself but if you are a chess fan you may notice that there is one piece missing you've got your king and queen you've got your rook you've got your pawns your bishops but where is the knight well as mark davis put it it's always night at the haunted mansion <laughs> classic mark <sighs> One thing to note about the Haunted Mansion here in Magic Kingdom that differs from every other Haunted Mansion around the world is that it is themed to be an upstate gothic manor in New York State. We are in Liberty Square. We are in Colonial America. We are across from Columbia Harbor House, which would be upstate uh, Boston area. So we are in New York at a manor. One thing very unique about the Haunted Mansion is that it is in a different land with a different theme at every Haunted Mansion around the world. If you've been to Disneyland, you know that it's similar to a plantation southern style manor because it's in New Orleans Square. If you were to travel to Disneyland Paris, it's in Frontierland and called Phantom Manor. Over in Tokyo, it actually sits in Fantasyland, unusually enough, and in Hong Kong Disneyland, it's called Mystic Manor, and it's in its very own land called Mystic Point. The only Disneyland park around the world not to have Haunted Mansion is Shanghai. A couple of things to look for while you are on the attraction. First things first, when you go into that first room and you see that portrait of the gentleman fading into a skeleton before your very eyes, that is the master of the home. His name is Master Gracie, named after Yale Gracie, the Imagineer known for his special effects. And and his special effects slap because this attraction's been open for over 50 years and the majority of the effects still in use today because they are simple, brilliant effects. Next thing, when you head into the stretch room again, you're going to hear that ghost host. They recently, within the last 10 years or so, upgraded the speaker so that you get a 360 of the ghost host traveling around you. Now, if you've ever wondered who those people in the portraits are, I can tell you for sure who one of them is. And that is our bride, Constance, who you may have heard of if you are a big mansion fan. One of my favorite things about the Haunted Mansion is that the Imagineers set forth clues in different stories, but a lot of the lore, a lot of the folk tales about the Haunted Mansion come from guests and cast members alike over the years. And one of the most famous stories is, of course, the bride who's pictured here in the attic. And the bride gets married a couple times. When you go through the attic after the ballroom scene, you will see the bride has a wedding, and then another wedding, and then another, and then another. She gets five weddings. And each time when you pa ride past the portrait of her and her groom, the groom's head disappears. What you might not notice, though, is that each time that happens, Constance, our bride, gets a new strand of pearls until eventually she's got five necklaces around her neck. Additionally, it's hard to see in this mansion. You can see it a little bit over in Disneyland easier, but anytime there's anything groom in the attic, it's knocked over, whether it be bride and groom champagne glasses one's knocked over, if it's like little figurines that would go on top of your cake, the groom one's knocked over, its head knocked off. 
But again, her name is Constance, and you can actually see her before you get to the attic. Again, we're going back to the stretch room. You may notice that one of the portraits is a woman sitting on top of a gravestone from a gentleman whose name is George with an ax in his head. She's holding a rose, and one of her husbands is named George in the attic, and she does hold an ax when you finally see her. Once you have boarded your doom buggy, a couple more things to look for. First of all, when you go past the guy in the coffin, you'll see his hand and you'll hear him go, let me out, let me out of here. That is voiced by Exitensio. Remember, Exitensio is the gentleman who wrote the lyrics for Yo Ho Yo Ho, as well as uh, the li lyrics for Grim Grinning Ghost. He also wrote the script. So your cadaver's pallor portrays an aura of foreboding. Thank you, Exitensio, for that brilliant piece of writing. We're also going to see the ghost host in the flesh. Not only do you hear him in the stretch room, but if you want to know what he looks like, shortly after you go past Exitensio in the coffin, you are going to turn around in your doom buggy. When you look to the right-hand side at one point, you will see a portrait of a gentleman with a rope around his neck holding an axe. That is the ghost host in the flesh after he you know, and uh, he used the axe to cut himself down. We are then going to travel into the room with the most iconic character of the mansion, Madame Leota. Madame Leota is brought to life by an Imagineer named Leota Tombs. With a name like that, it's no wonder she ended up in the Haunted Mansion. Yale Gracie and the other Imagineers wanted to test an effect they were working on to bring Madame Leota to life, and they needed a model. So they asked Leota if she would mind modeling for the animatronic. She did. They thought she looks great. She's going to be our Madame Leota. There's just one problem her voice was like this it was like a beautiful princess voice and madame leota's voice needs to be spooky and scary so they used madame leota's face but they used eleanor oddly's voice and if you've ever thought wow madame leota sounds familiar that's because eleanor oddly voiced both lady tremaine and cinderella and maleficent in sleeping beauty but you can hear leota tombs's actual voice as you're leaving the mansion when you see little leota hurry back that is Leota Toons' actual voice. We keep on going through the mansion. We get to my favorite scene, which is the ballroom scene, and there's a couple people I want you to look for. First of all, Grandma in the rocking chair. That is the same grandmother on Carousel of Progress. Second of all, remember that pirate whistling for the dog in the final scene? It is now a lady ghost blowing out the candles on her birthday cake. And as we get through the bride scene, we're going to get down into the graveyard. You're going to see the five singing ghosts, singing grim grinning ghosts. That is brought to you by the Mellow Man, a popular music group at the time. And one of them's head knocked over. A lot of people, because of the stash, think it's Walt Disney. And they get mad that the Disney company's disrespecting their founder that way. But it's not Walt Disney. It's Thurl Ravenscroft, who is more better known as being the voice of Tony the Tiger. Because he's great. He also sang You're a Mean One, Mr. Grinch, in the original cartoon. And the last thing I'll tell you about Haunted Mansion before we go ahead and get in line is that my favorite effect from Disneyland, the only reason that regular, not Nightmare Before Christmas, Haunted Mansion in Disneyland contends with Haunted Mansion here, well, that's the Hatbox Ghost. The Hatbox Ghost is an amazing effect that Yale Gacy tried to perfect, wasn't able to do it. They brought it to Disneyland decades later. It is coming to Disney World's Haunted Mansion next year. Very, very excited about that. Eek! Okay, let's go now. When you go through the lightning lane here, listen to the the tap. I love that. Again, you gotta look at the horticulture. The plants really do tell a story when you are in different locations. For starters, I love the blood red roses here outside the Haunted Mansion. I also love the hearse being pulled by a ghost horse. And I love that unlike more manicured places in the park like Main Street USA, the mansion has sat abandoned because it's a spooky, scary place to be. So the lawn is often unkempt and they actually go in with scissors to take care of some of that to make sure it looks a little ragged like it's been abandoned. I went through the lightning lane today because I'd purchased it. Uh, to get through Pirates and it has an hour long wait here at the mansion but there are a ton of details in the extended queue. There's gravestones honoring a bunch of the Imagineers. There's the bride's ring. There's actually so much detail and backstory in this ride. I could probably do a video just on Haunted Mansion especially if we include footage from Disneyland's Haunted Mansion. So if you'd like that, you let me know. A super duper creepy thing is that when you are leaving the stretch room, if you kind of hang back. So if you want to be out of the stretch room first, stand under the ballerina. If you want to be out of the stretch room last, stand under uh, Constance, the bride, the woman on the gravestone. But if you listen closely, you can actually hear the gargoyles and the ghosts whispering things like, get out. Very spooky.
And uh, from spooky to disgusting, I'm going to tell you one of my favorite things about the Haunted Mansion. I mentioned this in Tower of Terror at the Hollywood Studios version of this. But if you look up at the cobwebs, a lot of people want to know how they're made, how they look so realistic and spooky scary. But actually, they're made by humans. You helped make these at the Haunted Mansion. Every now and again, they'll get too heavy and they'll have to take them down. And then they bring out this machine that kind of is like a hot glue gun and it sprays this sticky substance on things like light fixtures and candelabras. Then natural uh, sediments, dust hair, skin, sticks to it making the cobwebs that we have and love in the Haunted Mansion. So, you're welcome. That attraction is just Imagineering chef's kiss couple things. One, with the Hatbox ghosts coming, are they evicting somebody or are they going to finally have a thousand ghosts? Second of all, there's just so much to say about that attraction, about how some of the very simple but brilliant effects work. More about the Imagineers, more secrets to look for on the attraction. I could fill, again, a whole video just on Haunted Mansion. So if you want me to, let me know. Not going to lie to you, probably going to do it anyway because I'm in charge. This is my company. But I'd prefer it if you guys wanted me to. I'll give you one more before we leave them. This one's for you, Max. As you leave, there is a pet cemetery here at the mansion, and uh, if you look up in the back, you may notice a familiar friend. That's right, it's Jay Thaddeus Toad. He was added there after the mini adventures of Winnie the Pooh replaced his attraction, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride in Fantasyland. You can't read the epitaph, but rumor has it, it says, here lies Toad, sad but true, not as marketable as Winnie the Pooh. Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, one of my favorite Magic Kingdom attractions, a delightful coaster where you are aboard a runaway train in a mining town. Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, like Splash, has a 40 inch height requirement and it is considered to be the wildest ride in the wilderness. Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, again, you are going through a mining village uh, because there's gold in them, their hills. Now, hopefully by this point in the series, you know that Disney does not do anything halfway and they like to be as authentic as possible. So a lot of the equipment that you're gonna see on Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, from things like this water pump right here to some of the mining equipment, wheels, etc., that is all antique equipment that Disney Imagineers found going to different auctions, going to different flea markets, looking around, especially in California so that they could have real authentic pieces to put into Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. I just love that. I love that Disney does that. There's actually a department of Imagineering that's responsible for doing things like flea market shopping all over the world to find props for their different attractions and lands, which sounds like an amazing job. Fun fact about me, I've actually been to the real Big Thunder Mountain. It's in Sedona, Arizona. I was on one of those iconic pink Jeep tours on a friend's bachelorette and the guy was pointing at all different things, things to look at, and he said, and if you look over there that's big thunder mountain and i was like he goes yeah like the disney attraction any fans out there and i was like me and all my friends were like that one talk to that one so yeah there that's the real one a couple things to look for on big thunder mountain railroad both within the regular queue and the attraction itself for starters remember our friend imaginer tony baxter over from splash mountain he had a big hand in big thunder mountain railroad and you can actually see a portrait of him he has been painted in the queue as barnabas t bouillon the founder of the big thunder mining company so hello to tony you can also see nods to the fire chief, Richard LaPere, who's actually the real fire chief of the Reedy Creek Improvement District, which is the municipality that Walt Disney World sits in. It's a whole government thing. Don't get me started on that. Uh, that recently made headlines, but that's not the point. The point is the Reedy Creek Improvement District is the actual municipality that Disney sits in, uh, and the real fire chief of that municipality is Richard LaPere, so there's nods to him throughout the queue as well. Additionally, if you take a look at some of the signs, they're going to have nods to different Imagineers throughout the attraction, as well as different places you can really go in Frontierland. Places like Pecos Bills. I love when lands, I talked about this in Africa in the Animal Kingdom video, I love when lands reference other things within the land, bringing the fictional cities, the fictional towns to life. And last but certainly not least, if you've ridden this before, you have heard someone to say, hang on to your hats and glasses, because this here's the wildest ride in the wilderness. Did you know? That's Ben Franklin. You know, yes, yes, the real Ben Franklin. Not president, but often thought to be a president. The key with the kite guy. Yeah, the real Ben Franklin. He recorded this. 
No, he didn't. It was actually Dallas McKinnon, a voice actor who also voiced Benjamin Franklin in The American Adventure, the show over at Epcot. He was also Zeke in The Country Bears, and he has some smaller roles in notable films such as Sleeping Beauty, Mary Poppins, 101 Dalmatian, and The Cartoon Grinch. So again, Disney loves picking voice actors and using them over and over and over. Because this here's the wildest ride in the wilderness. Well, friends, that is a wrap on this video and our secrets of the most popular rides in Disney World series. If you want it to be, if you want a part two and hit some of the other attractions we didn't do, let us know down in the comments. There's so many more great attractions here in the Magic Kingdom we didn't cover yet. Space Mountain, Buzz Light, your Space Ranger Spin, Mini Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, Peter Pan's Flight. There's also more at Epcot. There's more rides everywhere. If you want more secrets, let us know. If you want a whole mansion video, let us know that as well. In the meantime, friends, make sure to rate, review, subscribe, follow us on social media, and until next time, friends, I'm Molly. It's been magical. Now go watch the Hollywood Studios version of this. Bye!